because I want to talk about some concepts and pair them up together. Can you talk a bit about that feeling of being the second generation in your country and the pressure tied into that and the need to get straight A's, etc. Because you've made many people say that they feel like they deserved or the parent, their parents deserve that they're trying their best to achieve the greatest dreams, right? Can you just talk about that concept and how that reflects, you know, upbringing, education and that drive and ambition? Yes, definitely. I think, I mean, the, the kind of obvious, um, the, the, w- exactly what you're saying. I think we do have this, our, as second generations, we do have this awareness and make us aware of it too, how much they sacrifice to give us all the opportunities that you get when you grow up in Norway, Norway versus the countries we're from, right? The fact that education is free, which is something we in Norway take for granted, um, which is not something you, you take for granted other places. So, and, and I think that it's also about, you know, leading by example. So, My mom, she is the youngest of nine siblings. She's from a village, literally a village outside of New Delhi. Um, And she, during her lifetime, during her generation have gone from being, you know, a rural working class Indian to a upper middle class Norwegian, you know, just her. Um, And my, my dad has a similar story. And, you know, if that is who your parents are, you know, when people say, oh, Vashali, you've been able to do so much at a young age, I say, you know, you should meet my parents. I haven't really, you know, I haven't done half of what they have done during their generation. Um, so I think definitely, you know, where you get that grit from, you don't take anything for granted. Uh, and you have these people that are leading by example. But then I think thirdly, and I think it's also a kind of underestimated aspect of being second generation is you always feel like an outsider. Um, Sometimes people make that very clear to you that you are other, as we say it, or you're you're very clear on it yourself. You know, I didn't grow up with a lot of people who looked like me. And I think when you have that outsider perspective, you tend to be very underestimated and you're sort of like the underdog, right? And, And I don't know about you, but for me, I love being underestimated. I think underestimated and being, you know, being underestimated is very motivating for me. You know, I I get, I get this like feeling, you know, I'm going to show you, you know, you think I can't do this. Well, I'm going to show you that I can. And, and I think that level of adversity that you feel because you're an outside people tell you, you can't do things. It just, you just want to prove them so much. And I remember I mean, this is sort of a, I can't believe I'm sharing this on a podcast, but um, you know, the LeBron documentary, More Than a Game. I don't know if you've seen that. So, so it's about LeBron. For those of you who haven't seen it, it's called More Than a Game. And it's not only about LeBron, but it's about all of his buddies that he plays basketball with during his childhood. And there's this one guy that plays basketball in this group of five, and his name is Drew Joyce and Drew Joyce is literally the shortest person, you know, he's a really tiny guy, really skinny. And there's this, you know, whenever I go on an important job interview or I'm, I'm having an exam or something. And I, I I feel this, like, I want to, I want to kind of foster this underdog feeling. I will watch the scene from this documentary when Drew Joyce, who is, so underestimated with en- from anyone gets traded into a game and scores seven three pointers during that game and sort of proves everyone wrong right and that that i don't rewatch the whole documentary but i'll watch that clip on youtube every time i have like a job interview <laughs> so so i think yeah i think i think being the underdog is something that really motivates me i don't think i'm considered an underdog anymore maybe but yeah, I think that's a really important aspect, I think, that is overlooked when you talk about people of second generation, for sure. Definitely. It's funny that you reference LeBron, because I have a similar, not documentary, but there's a book about Stephen Curry, 
who has like the yeah. same because he was the smallest guy, tiniest guy, and look at him now, just beating the three point record. But it's so it's again a bit funny because I, I was uh, about to ask you about another movie or a TV series. I can't remember if it's Sex in the City or Girls or anything like that. But you have used that series as a reference into why you decided to go to New York and really go for it. Do you remember that story at all? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, interesting that you asked me about that. So basically, I'm a part of uh, the alumni organization of SICT, which is what the Crown Prince of Norway has. Uh, it's sort of a, it, his philosophy behind it is to bring people between the age of 20 and 40 together every year and sort of foster collaborations um, across industries. Uh, and, and sort of make good things happen. And um, in 2016, I was attending this conference and I was asked to, um, I was asked to spend five minutes talking about what drives me, what's my sort of driver. And, you know, usually when people get these five minutes, they spend it talking about what they've done and what they've achieved in life. And I remember at that point, I just started working at the oil fund and I, you know, honestly didn't feel I'd achieved anything, you know, I'd, I'd just been ambitious and, and, you know, reached the goals I wanted to set, but I hadn't started a company. I hadn't, you know, saved lives in any ways. I hadn't, you know, served as a soldier. I hadn't done anything like that. So I felt, you know, if I have five minutes in front of all these sort of future leaders of Norway that are young and ambitious, Prince and other kind of CEOs and so on, what do I want to tell them? And I think one thing that especially, you know, I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. I think as a millennial, I think that especially in Norway, we grow up having the luxury, I guess, to focus all of our energy to kind of, you know, on the highest uh, highest level of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? You know, self-realization. We don't have to focus on getting food on our table. We don't have to focus on, you know, getting a roof over our heads. We can just focus on kind of being the best that we can be in whatever, you know, whatever shape or form. And I think my agenda for those five minutes was to tell people like me, my peers, you know, that's great. But I think at the end of the day, we need to have humbleness that, you know, at the end of the day, we're just workers. And, and what we're trying to do is we need to collaborate in order to solve problems that are quite imminent. You know, when we talk about social inequality globally, when we talk about climate change, we're, when we look at politicians not being able to make those changes at them, you know, or they, their shortcomings, I would say, you know, I think it's important that we try to humble ourselves in the sense that it's not only about you reaching your, you know, potential, but it's more about how can I be a part of changing the world to the better and maybe not getting attention for it, but just being a part of, you know, the solution going forward. And I think the reason I mentioned it was from girls is that it's the opening scene where Hannah says that, you know, I want to be the voice of my generation. And I, I remember being so sort of, um, what do you call it? Like self, uh, self-focused self that I was like, I was laughing because yes, it is completely who I am. And I think our generation is, but I think we shouldn't be that way, I guess. And I think that was sort of my agenda of what I wanted to tell people that day.